As mentioned during the introduction this morning, Ohio's pork industry is a significant part of the Ohio agricultural economy as a primary driver of pork and soybean use for beef and export support. The industry has gone through several transformations over the last decade, and the future continues to include new challenges. Moderating today's panel on pork supply chain is Dr. Brian Rowe, who serves as the Van Buren Professor in the Department of Agricultural, Environmental, and Department of Development Economics, where he also serves as the undergraduate program leader. Dr. Rowe grew up on a dairy farm in southern Wisconsin and received a bachelor's degree in agricultural economics and agricultural journalism from the University of Wisconsin Madison. Since arriving at Ohio State in 1998, Rowe has worked broadly in the areas of agricultural and environmental economics, focusing on issues including agricultural marketing, information policy, behavioral economics, and product quality. He has served as editor of the American Journal of Agricultural Economics and leads the Ohio State Food Waste Collaborative. Some of his current research include the economics of food waste and farm nutrient management. Please welcome Dr. Brian Rowe to lead today's pork supply chain panel. Thanks. Uh, excited to be here with this great panel of individuals to my right. Um, the pork sector is a great example of modern supply chains. <clears throat> modern supply chains are miracles of technology, of commerce, of politics, of business practice, <clears throat> of health, nutrition. They bring together uh, a vast array of elements to help us get from those nutrients in the ground, through the animals, <clears throat> through the supply chain, to our local retailer, to our own homes. And they are incredibly, incredibly important part of our everyday lives as a consumer, as a farmer, and as anybody working in between the two. Like any complex system that spans uh, technologies, areas, countries, um, supply chains are buffeted by any number of, of issues um, ranging from trade to health to nutrition uh, to policy. And um, how they respond is going to be very critical to uh, the operations, not only the farm sector, but of uh, consumers in everyday life. Today, we're going to talk with these folks here and let them introduce themselves, uh, give us their experience in the pork supply chain. I'm excited to introduce to you three great and distinguished panel members. Dave Heisler, first here on, on the panel. Um, comes to us here from Ohio State, 85 grad of our very own department, uh, uh, with a major in agricultural economics and a minor in animal science. From 85 to about 2001, he worked as a swine specialist at Purina. <clears throat> um, um, they then purchased his first farm at a very auspicious time uh, in 1997, which is about a year before. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one of the probably the worst eras of prices in the modern uh, in, uh, modern pork markets there in 1998. Uh, under his leadership, that farm pork champ grew to be about 22,000 sows. Uh, since 2008, he's owned uh, Fine Swine LLC, a farrow to wean pig operation, with uh, over 100 employees and 30,000 sows, uh, over nine locations with headquarters right here in Hillview. After that, we'll hear from uh, Don Davidson. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Davidson is an 82 grad from OSU from the Dairy Science Program, and then he received his uh, DVM from the College of Vet Medicine in 1986. Uh, after working in small animal practice uh, out of Bellefontaine, uh, he went to Illinois and got a master's degree in uh, integrated food animal management systems. <clears throat> he worked in several roles for um, some integrated production systems, authority uh, packing out of Los Angeles as their manager, veterinarian and general manager. And in 2005, as the director of production for Hormel uh, hog operations, uh, with over 54,000 sows and about 1.2 million wean to big uh, market pigs out west in California, Wyoming, Colorado. Since 2014, <clears throat> Dr. Davidson has served as a hog and turkey grow manager for Cooper Farms and Port Recovery. Um, and they're partnered with Clemens Food Group in Coldwater, Michigan. Our last uh, guest brings a little flair from the ACC. Judson Armatrout has been with the Kroger Company for the past 10 years after uh, receiving his training at uh, industrial engineering at Georgia Tech. 
and then an, an MBA out of uh, UNC, University of North Carolina. I started with uh, IBP as an industrial engineer back in 2000, and his family has roots uh, in uh, uh, beef feedlots in Iowa as well. He moved to their case ready group in 2002 and 2005 and worked on operational improvements and uh, capital project design. After leaving uh, IBP in Tyson in 2005 to get his MBA, they moved on to some traceability and food safety technology companies before starting his uh, current role with Kroger. Spent the last six years building their Case Ready Fresh Meat Network, which uh, covers 17 different plants where they provide Kroger stores across the country. And obviously many of you know this, but Kroger is probably the largest retailer in the country and located right here in Cincinnati um, for all their pork, beef, and grinds. The team's responsible for all aspects of the program from inbound raw materials all the way to the finished product itself. Um, prior to his current role, he spent four years implementing new procedures across Kroger's fresh supply chain. Uh, but now we want to start out and just let the group introduce themselves and give about a five minute overview of kind of what they see in terms of the pork chain of their day to day lives in each of their individual roles. So, Dave, you want to take it away? At the bio, well, how do we turn this thing on? Let's see here. Yes, there we go. You can see how much experience I've had with this. Um, the bio says most of it. I uh, I spent pretty much my entire uh, post career in the swine business, which I had no real experience in before. Um, I had a nice visit with Dr. Urban earlier today and shared some of his influences. Uh, learned a lot in the business uh, from 85 to the early mid 90s. Obviously, everything consolidated very rapidly. I think it will continue to do that. Um, when I jumped in, um, maybe got lucky, he joked about that. I started out selling wean pigs for a year or so and had a fixed market during the 98 debacle, which allowed me to, to uh, not go backwards and, and gave me a leg up after that uh, when the market did turn a little bit and I started finishing. As he mentioned in the bio, I finished pigs uh, Five, six hundred thousand of them through about 2013 and 14. When I made a change of ownership, bought my partner out and decided that uh, I hate to say our gorillas in our industry like Smithfield and frankly the Coopers who uh, aren't at that level, but very, very big organizations that the finishing business in light of what happened with ethanol was probably too big for me. So I was looking for uh, one link in the chain along the supply chain of pork and fortunately found a few partners that would allow me to specialize, which I think throughout the ag industry or the years um, that has ebbed and flowed. And I think maybe it's, it's true today, you know, in the good old days, everybody had pigs and chickens and cows. And uh, I chose to specialize in pigs and then further refine that down to just the sow business. Uh, Ohio is not the most ideal place, in my opinion, to grow market hogs. Price of corn is higher and the market is a little more difficult. You might argue that, but I guess you can't move to Iowa with your production. So uh, uh, I felt like having my pig shipped to a better location would allow a niche for me in the market that allowed me to specialize and, and, and have maybe nearly the number of sows they do, but not nearly the the capital invested in, and uh, grow my family's business uh, just along the supply chain instead of being totally integrated. Hi, Don Davidson, originally from Ohio. Uh, actually started out in a mixed animal practice in Bell Fountain about the time Honda was building there. And um, I didn't want to be a small animal the rest of my life. And so I uh, didn't think my future was going to be much in a large animal practice. I was also interested in the business side. I've never really got exposed to it being a veterinarian. So um, University of Illinois had a, had a program at the time called IFAMS, Integrated Food Animal Management Systems, uh, that was uh, developed to train veterinarians in all other aspects of the, uh, this, specifically the pig business. So that program uh, did nothing veterinarian. It was uh, finance, uh, genetics, nutrition, facilities, uh, business and technical writing statistics. So 
uh, that, that it taught you everything else that you didn't get in veterinary school about how to how to manage farms and run farms. Uh, second year of that of that program, you did eight week projects out in the industry with genetics companies, nutrition companies, pharmaceuticals, so on and so forth. And ended up doing a project out in the Central Valley, California, uh, with a large farming company, actually farming uh, cotton farming company that had sows that were supplying pigs to a plant in Los Angeles uh, called Farmer John, family-owned business, Clarity Packing. And, uh, had 8,000 sows in the Central Valley there, surrounded by all the dairies. And uh, the reason they did that is maybe part of this, the family located in Los Angeles, I was there to see some of the last pigs being hauled on train, being hauled into that plant out there, and it wasn't pretty. Uh, and then the, the other problem they had is the quality wasn't there in those pigs. They were buying those pigs out of the Midwest buying stations that nobody in the Midwest wanted. And they knew to survive that they had to change. So they started building farms out West, uh, ended up relocating to Arizona. We built, put 14,000 sows in the high desert at Arizona. And uh, a few years later, uh, bought a farm in Wyoming and that's 14,000 sows. And about that, about 2007, the, the, the Clarity family, very successful family, great people, saw the same thing that they didn't know if they were going to survive. They were processing about 7,000 pigs a, uh, a week in Los Angeles with, with the Smithfields and everybody else. So uh, they ended up selling the business to uh, Hormel. And as a Hormel employee, they had 25,000 sows in uh, Western or Eastern Colorado in the front range. I also managed those sows. So I did all the management of all the farms. Uh, and now that farm is owned by Smithfield. So that's how the uh, consolidation is working. Uh, wanted to get back and had their life changes and uh, know, knew the Cooper people for several years and kept bucking them to give me a job back here. And I like the family, I like the family type of the business. Uh, so they uh, came back to Cooper's in 2014. And uh, again, my role was even though I'm a veterinarian, it's mostly management and trying to make them better and grow. And today we're at uh, about 28,000 sows or this time next year we'll be providing 850,000 pigs to the Clemens plant called Water Michigan. And I was part of that process then too, of them looking at their future and aligning up with the packer uh, part of that whole process. And so it's a, it's a good relationship today. And, and I think it's comfortable enough now too that they see opportunities for growth because they know where they're going. That's where I am today. Chudza, could you hand me the other microphone? I'll get that working. No, this is working. Okay, great. So let me stop it. Good morning. Um, so I've been with Kroger, uh, as uh, Brian mentioned, 10 years. Um, the last six I was recruited in uh, to run the case ready meet network and to build it out. Um, I had some uh, unique experience at the time. Uh, the role uh, was only created two years prior. So uh, when I look at it, the job itself has existed for eight years. Uh, my boss, who's uh, our director of meat and seafood, had it for a year. Someone else had it for a little less, and I've had it for almost six, uh, which makes me crazy or insane. I hadn't figured that out yet. <laughs> uh, I'm responsible uh, on a daily basis for uh, 17 plants across the country operated by third parties. Uh, JBS, uh, Tyson, Smithfield, uh, Empire Packing that provide our fresh uh, cut pork, steaks, uh, ground beef uh, for our stores. Um, so we do on average uh, total volume seven and a half million pounds a week servicing seven million customers. Uh, I feed a lot of people uh, and I do that with the help of you know, the, the pork industry here in Ohio as well as the rest of the country to be able to do that. Um, I've got a unique background uh, in that growing up, I've worked around uh, cow-calf operations, my grandfather's farm. Uh, my dad and my grandfather partnered on a feedlot in Iowa when I was a kid. So I used to work summers up there. Um, went to work for IVP, uh, did work with uh, RFID traceability in the late 90s, uh, individual animal management, those things. Um, did IVP, both slaughter and processing and case ready. Uh, helped design one of their plants, uh, made the other two plants very efficient, um, and then went, came to work for Kroger. So I've had, in the industry within retail, everybody moves from the stores into different roles. Uh, I have a unique uh, background that I've never worked in a Kroger store. 
Uh, I have worked in retail as a kid, um, but uh, never for Kroger. So when I was recruited in, it was to be able to provide a different, a different view of the industry, the supply chain, and what's needed. Uh, traditionally within retail, you'll have what we call category or commodity management who are responsible for assortment decisions, sales strategies, things like that. Um, what we're going to carry assortment wise. So uh, using uh, pork as the example, we have commodity pork program and a simple truth pork program meeting different customer needs. We have sales planning, which is writing our weekly ads. They're figuring out what are we going to put on the front page? What are we going to put on the inside? How do they make all the financial metrics work? And then we have the procurement side, which is working with our suppliers that's ordering product on a daily basis to replenish our DCs. Those are kind of the three primary buckets within a merchandising department. My role is unique in that I'm essentially the largest fresh meat supplier to the Kroger company sitting within Kroger. Uh, so my team oversees everything, raw materials, uh, raw material quality, raw material, what, uh, what specs do we use? Uh, Operationally within the case ready plants, what does it cost? How do we become more efficient? What packaging solutions do we use? Uh, all the way through to on shelf. We go through and we audit our own products. We provide that feedback back to our stores, back to our plants. Hey, here's opportunities we see. Uh, we also work more upstream with raw material suppliers going through certifying new plants that we'll be willing to purchase from them, uh, as well as looking at operations and figuring out, okay, Here's the quality that we're getting out of the plant. Here's the opportunities that we see. How can we work to get better? Um, so overall, that's uh, what my team's responsible for. Uh, as of today, there's four of us. Uh, three, uh, two, are, two are based in the West. Uh, myself and another fellow are based here in the East. Uh, and so we oversee all 17 plants. <clears throat> wow, quite a great amount of experience here. So let's dive into some topics that are um, out there right now. Uh, since animal husbandry be started, we've had uh, animal disease, think back to the 1800s and Texas fever in cattle. To, but today the, the top thing is animal, uh, African swine fever, um, devastating Asia. Uh, some reports of 35, 40% of breeding herd loss in China. Um, maybe we'll start off with the veterinarian here, uh, Dr. Davidson. When I say African swine fever in US hog industry, uh, what do you say? <laughs> Yeah, we, we give it a lot of attention today, uh, both on the uh, live side and the health uh, concerns as, and again on the uh, opportunity side on the maybe, maybe what it may mean to us to uh, uh, get into the China business a little bit more. Um, from, the, from the health side of it, you know, I, I, there's a lot of I saw on the, on the deal, they talked about feed ingredients and things like that with African swine fever and and uh, been to several seminars, the people that are out there living it and been in it both in uh, China or in Asia and Europe. And uh, um, I think that uh, I'm not just downplaying the risk of feed, but we're missing it. We're treating African swine fever like we did PD a few years ago. Um, I think the biggest risk for African swine fever and these people that lived it are uh, above the feed is, is uh, people, uh, international travel, and uh, products coming in uh, on the people side of it. Honestly, I think our risk is is us. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of joint business going back and forth with veterinarians and production companies in China and the United States. A lot of travel back and forth. And you know, the reality of it is, you know, we talk about downtime. Those people have <clears throat> payrolls to make into. They're not let. They're not. I'm sure just people that are visiting China aren't coming back and sitting out of a farm for a week. So that, that's scary that I think we might be our own worst enemy. That's how it might be introduced. Um, Dr. Dave Pyburn with the pork board made a statement a year ago, and I believe that it's probably here already. It just hasn't made its way to pig yet. And that's, that's how it'll affect. So you think this poses a unique risk compared to previous uh, animal disease issues <clears throat> affecting the pork sector, or is it just that it's, um, it's the, the one we're facing right now in terms of preventative measures? Is there anything new the industry has to undertake or just keep making sure that they're meeting all their best practices? Well, the best practices will work to keep it out. And those best practices include, you know, visitor on farms or not allowing visitors to farms or knowing where they come from. But the other things I think we've got to shore up is 
they, I, I've read some statistics where they think that they, they maybe confiscate 50% of the illegal product that comes in on, on luggage and people traveling this company, our country and uh, African swine fever survives pretty easily in the uh, raw or uh, lightly processed pork products. So, uh, uh, you know, I've done some international travel and still hear that, that uh, you fill out those forms or now it's electronically you fill them out and they still don't do a very good job of asking you if you've been on farms or where you've been or doing it. You know, they, they've increased a beagle brigade and they've added more beagles to sniff out <laughs> luggage. But uh, I think there's a big opportunity there. And you, you hear about some of the other countries. Australia recently just uh, uh, banned two people that within the last week or two that were coming in the country and they found pork products that were positive for ASF. So wow. to my point, I think it's here. Just it probably hadn't made its way to the pig yet. So maybe quick around the, the group here, kind of, do you have a contingency plan in place for, for that fateful day if it should happen in, in terms of how your organization will respond? Real quickly for us, continued focus on biosecurity, uh, working with the pork board on the secure pork supply. Um, my past, we were 100% integrated, didn't have to work with growers, and it's a little bit different. So having 250 plus grower families, uh, biosecurity on their farms, uh, big, uh, big emphasis on biosecurity, doing what we, what we know we can do today. Our big concern as part of as we talk about supply chain, my pigs go to three different buyers in uh, four or five different states. And that's the real concern with this. By the time we would see it, uh, if we're sending multiple thousand pigs a week all over the country from Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, how far can it spread? Um, we've tried to put contingency plans, but it's from probably three to 14 days that animals would be locked down. Have you, have you heard, who knows, minimum three? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, right now it's a 72 hour deal. And the problem with it is African swine fever looks like every disease we have today. So there's very likelihood people on the farm aren't gonna take it serious until you know this PERS or this PD or the salmonella is not going away. Maybe we better test for it. And that's two weeks later. And now, now, now it's disseminated. That's the concern. So the industry and the pork producers, pork board have helped us run some scenarios and you know, those all sound great, but nobody quite knows how it's gonna happen. And you know, my fear in a lockdown where we count on compared to the Honda thing you mentioned, the just-in-time movement, which makes an efficient supply chain. If I got pigs that got a wean tomorrow morning, where do they go? And that day, I hope we never see, right? So. What about the consumer side? What do you think in terms of a Kroger response, and then how do you think consumers would respond to that kind of an announcement? Yeah, I mean, as we look at it right now, the consumers not having a response to it uh, because they know it's not here. Uh, and unfortunately, for the, the way the American consumer thinks, if it's not here, it's not an issue. Uh, you know, we take food safety, food security very seriously. Uh, we have constant conversations with all of our major packer partners, uh, understanding, you know, what are they doing upstream? How are they looking at it? Um, you know, as we go through the, you know, that type of scenario, uh, we buy, I mean, we're one of the largest pork buyers in the country. Um, so, you know, we have multiple suppliers that we use um, and pretty much, you know, most of their operations downstream, you know, you don't have a farmer necessarily selling to a lot of, you know, there's some vertical alignment, but not totally. So we are dependent on them to be able to, to help identify those opportunities as soon as they can. You know, we would have to make shifts uh, from a supply basis as soon as something's identified um, to be able to move forward, so. No, is that part of, I mean, we've seen uh, Walmart integrate back to the farm. We've seen Costco with their rotisserie chicken operation try to integrate back to the farm. Is, do things like disease management, um, animal welfare tracking, is that a motivation for uh, a, a Kroger to think about this more seriously to follow suit? Uh, we've had several conversations and I've been a part of those, uh, helping educate senior leadership as we look at what are those opportunities. Um, you know, specifically looking at those examples for Costco, um, you know, they're looking at how to, how to stabilize a cost for a, a loss leader for them. Um, 
and you know they took rotisserie chicken, which is the easiest thing to produce because you're not having to deal with balancing it, the whole carcass utilization. Uh, as Walmart looks at their supply chain, I've had several conversations with folks that were involved in those conversations and kind of try to understand what their thinking was. And you know, and you know, retailer retail in the U.S. is very different from retail in the rest of the world. Um, the U.S. because of the box beef and the box pork industry, everything's a la carte. Uh, pretty much, you know, there's very few programs where you're balancing the utilization of the whole animal. As we look at um, the rest of the world, um, Australia is an example. Woolworths, um, they buy whole animals, so they have to merchandise the entire animal. So they're trying to figure out how to balance all those needs. So as as we've looked at it as Kroger, you know, we'll continue to evaluate what's what's the right thing for us. But when you look at vertical integration and actually owning animals. Uh, there's risks in there with hedging, uh, cash flow tie-up, things like that, um, that aren't, aren't appealing to us, whereas the potential maybe uh, to partner with someone where they're, they're absorbing that side of it and we're getting what we need out of that program, uh, we do do some of those partnerships today. Mm -hmm. Dave and John, thoughts about the, 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 um, the Walmart and the Costco integration back to the very foundational level thoughts from your side of the industry on, on those types of trends? Good, bad, indifferent? Oh, I, I, you know, I get mixed on those. I always wonder where the consumers are, I don't know what a monopoly is, but when I hear what you just said, that they're a loss leader, so here they are out competing with the farms or farmers with something that they're gonna manufacture and sell for a loss is, is, is concerning that I, I guess, part of my leaving the chain and moving up and thinking about working with one of my people that I supply is truly a packer, you know, because I think, I, I think it's going to, uh, we're going to further integrate. It's not going to stop. I mean, one more, every time there's a disaster in the market, X percent go on up the chain and, and you need product. So you step in or somebody steps in a little bit further, so, which is how Hatfield really kind of, own most of their production day other than your partners. So it's, uh, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's why I have a job today. <laughs> you know? uh, and, and it happened when I was out West, uh, it, it happens a lot stronger when you, when you work for a company like Hormel Foods that they're protecting the brand. And it's happening now with, with uh, the, the uh, Cooper family with the Clemens group. And that's why we are so, uh, I spend very little of my time on health. I spend a lot of my time with people and welfare, animal welfare programs, uh, antibiotic programs, uh, auditing programs, uh, a lot of that. I mean, I'm, right now we have to supply Clemens with an annual list of things that we're doing on the farm and um, welfare and auditing and validation of that. And uh, so I spend a lot of time with grower families that have been in the business a long time, even longer than me, that grow up on the farm that don't understand those things and why they're important. And, you know, we, we don't necessarily agree with them either, but we're just because of the way the business operates, we got to be able to adapt and be flexible and to change. And so we got to, it's our goal to our job to train those people. That's where we got to be going. And, and these things are important and that's what they're demanding. And we're not going to survive if we don't, provide these things. Could you expand on kind of some of the trends you see in terms of animal welfare demands coming from the consumer side? What are the next yeah, items? Yeah, i got to be careful because then I might give some things up that they might not have <laughs> thought about. Already. Uh, you know, the, the gestation thing's over. I mean, that's done. We're 85% converted today and two farms left and those will happen next two years. So you don't hear much about that anymore. It's over. Uh, you know, some other things though on animal space now the, the, the pen thing, they're going to now dictating space. Um, a lot of these things aren't, aren't by science either. And you know, they're very smart. They, they know what space we have and what, what it costs us to, to either reduce inventory or to add space. And that's gonna make decisions of people who I want to stay in or not. Uh, you know, tail docking is a big deal. Antibiotics, castration. I mean, it's, a, it's just one thing or the, or, or the next is gonna, you know, a lot of things we do on the farm. And the bottom line is, as they, if they, as they conquer each one, they'll, they'll figure out the next thing. So, sow mortality, 
general mortality in farm. You know, they're, they're all they're all there out there. What about from the Kroger perspective? Are there does it seem that consumers have this very long list, or is it just <clears throat> um, uh, things pop up on occasion in terms of the the news from the consumer side? More uh, things just pop up on occasion. Um, you know, as we look at our animal welfare policies and sustainability goals, um, you know, our goal right now is defined as devastation crate free by 2025, um, mostly due to, you know, the size of our supplier base and, and the time and the investment those things take. Um, you know, we recognize that the industry isn't speedboats and it's turning aircraft carriers, so it's very slow changes. Um, you know, capital investments that need to be made uh, decisions that need to be made, as was mentioned. Um, so as we as we get feedback from customers, uh, we share that with our supplier partners. Uh, we also, you know, we engage in conversations with each of them um, twice a year. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, twice a year around, you know, where are they at sustainability wise? Uh, what are they doing uh, from a animal welfare? What's what's coming up the pipeline? Uh, things like that. So. Uh, there's a lot of two-way communication because we get direct feedback from our customers. They're getting direct feedback. Um, and then we try to figure out, okay, where, where are we headed and what makes sense? In terms of those consumers too, they're also demanding other products that are um, threatening the meat industry more broadly. Impossible burgers are out there beyond beef, <clears throat> um, beyond meat. Um, so how do you, I'd like to see each of you kind of respond to kind of your view of kind of that trend coming forward and how that might affect kind of uh, the way you're positioning yourselves. Okay. Um, we have seen incredible growth with it. Um, I was part of the group that originally uh, identified uh, Beyond Burgers uh, a couple years ago for our stores uh, and we tested out and uh, have seen an incredible customer response, uh, which has caused, uh, you know, the whole host of innovation from every CPG company, uh, every meat company trying to get into the space. So, you know, the more players come in and it becomes commoditized, it starts to shrink down. Um, you know, it's interesting. We actually have one fellow in our department who is uh, vegan uh, and he actually is the, used to be the pork assistant commodity manager. Now he's on the chicken side. Um, but we talked about, okay, we're going to put this in the meat department and he had jokingly said, well, you know, my people refer to that as the, the Department of Death. They're never going to come in there, you know, looking for those products. Uh, but we've had incredible growth with it. Uh, customers, you know, whether it's trading one meal uh, or whether it's people that, you know, have been strictly vegetarian or, you know, flexitarian or all these different things. Um, so I think that there's some staying power with it. Uh, I think right now it's a little, you know, overinflated and it'll come down. Um, but it all goes back to the product quality because vegetarian burgers and all those things have been around forever. The quality just wasn't that great. and had a very small consumer base. Uh, their consumer, you know, their technologies have gotten better uh, and customers have been more willing to try it and uh, have been satisfied with it. But I think as customers begin to understand just because it's made out of vegetables and, and things grown out of the ground, doesn't mean it's not highly processed and doesn't mean that it's a necessarily healthier version if all you've done is mimic the exact same thing that uh, that meat is today, so. That would be our take on it. Obviously, uh, I guess I've been warned as a protein producer, meat maybe, I don't know how we want to define everything, not to stick our head in the sand and say it's a trend because times do change, industries evolve or go away. Um, I guess what we just want, or my take would be, let's inform the consumers, not hide behind that it's a vegetable, and that would probably be a stretch to say that. And then, the, of course, we're taking the other side that there's nothing more pure than meat. If you overeat or overdo anything, it's not good for you. But just because it's got peas in it or something doesn't make it healthy. And the 27 ingredients that are in that, uh, I guess I would like, I think it shouldn't be in the meat. I don't care how they market it, put it over where it is and let people decide. And then it becomes our job, not only mine, but with working with Kroger to make a desirable, a desirable product that people will, will choose to, to consume. Yeah, I don't, I, you know, I don't think Cooper's going to get in the 
vegetable protein business. I don't see that today, but uh, I, I agree that uh, you know we're we're not threatened by it. We just we reinforce what we do. We do good and we do right. We we realize that people uh, consumer has a, a choice and it'll probably replace a little bit of the market. But we think uh, continue to do what we do good and that we'll, we'll still have our fair share of the market and uh, we agree to that. It, it's a kind of a fad now and it, it'll end up being a commodity. I mean, it all Smithfield, uh, Tyson, they're all looking for that business. And so the, the, the small guys that started it, you know, it's gonna become commoditized. So now I guess we're not threatened by it. We just look at it as a better opportunity to get better, so. One other thing uh, I'll say as we look at it from a meat standpoint, you know, consumers are asking for cleaner labels. Uh, so we've been going through over the last three years, I guess it is. Uh, Kroger had always run an enhanced pork program. Um, so we've been weaning ourselves off of that and going to a nat what we call a natural uh, or an unenhanced program. So that's what you find here at Ohio. Uh, we've got a couple of divisions. We'll finish transitioning here in 2020. But it allows our label to just say what's, you know, ingredients, pork ingredients, ground beef, you know, no chemicals, uh, no additives. Uh, so that, that is what consumers you know, are asking for. And then when you flip over, you know, some of these alternative meat, pro, uh, alternative meat items and you look at the ingredient list, there's a lot of ingredients. So that's one way that we look at from a meat department, meat strategy standpoint, being able to offer consumers a great quality experience with a clean label uh, keeps them in the category. I think we've got time for one <clears throat> round of questions here. Um, each of you have talked about, <clears throat> um, I know earlier about uh, strong staff and personnel to help you <clears throat> carry out the many complex tasks that you each have. Labor market's tight, right? It's uh, <clears throat> historically low unemployment. Um, not a lot of folks necessarily searching out ag jobs. Um, what do you see as the labor challenges facing each of your organizations right now in this space? Well, they're great. Um, we've been fortunate, you know, of course, Ohio's a populated state more than some in the, I want to say when you think of Iowa or Nebraska, but um, we pretty much ran out of steam being able to get the, I'm going to call it local people to do, do the work that we want. We have worked with Ohio State to do what's uh, a J visa, which is uh, an internship and have a uh, half a dozen of those. Um, We've also evolved into the TN visa, which is a three-year program uh, that started through NAFTA. Um, so for those of you for or against Hispanic labor, that's where it is. It's a, it's a legitimate program, um, but, but the, I don't know if the Coopers would find the same thing, but to just flat out find, lack of a better term, the local farm boy that wants to get in and do our work, we, we, can't, we can't keep enough. Uh, I think the pork producers have listed that, that we are, the ag industry is growing at a 2% rate and there just aren't 2% more, uh, more people that want to get into agriculture in the future. So the, the market's probably going to remain tight. Uh, one of the questions I saw, does income drive it? I don't think it's income. I mean, I don't, if you don't want to work in a hog barn or a turkey barn or in a processing plant, uh, I don't know that we're going to be able to pay enough uh, to just drive people to our industry. Yeah, it's huge. Uh, when I was out west, of course, the uh, you know it was majority of the Hispanics. You know, it's a lot different culture out there. There's acceptance as opposed to when I came here. Um, but we Coopers are doing that within the last two years. We probably have several TN visas on the farm today, and uh, it, it's because of, of we don't we don't get the people locally that want to do it. Um, my, my biggest, the great employees, uh, my biggest concern is that we've asked them to come here, that we have to acclimate to their culture and will we do that? Uh, and that's one thing, but other things we do, you know, uh, exact, uh, you know, increase our pay, you know, our margins get tighter, but increase pay, uh, you know, read all the things about Generation X and millennials trying to be flexible to how they want to work and when they want to work and doing things like that. Not so much here where I'm today, but in uh, when I was out west, we uh, worked a lot with you know mothers that had kids in school that maybe wanted to work four hours a day, being real flexible and things to to get people in these farms to uh, to work with animals. 
and it's difficult. Uh, some of the biggest challenges then is you just have a good leader in that farm and you can, you can work with a lot of the people. Uh, that's a, also another challenge is you know, people that want to lead these farms. Uh, from a retail perspective, uh, that's one of our biggest opportunities is no one wants to be a meat cutter anymore. Uh, so as we look at it, uh, that's where my program and my team uh, becomes more valuable because we're able to produce more of that product in our third party plants, uh, send it in, um, ready to go on shelf so that we can have, you know, the labor we do have available, whether that's, a, you know, an 18 year old kid at the end of the night, uh, if a customer comes in and there's a hole in the shelf, he's able to go back, get product that's cut uh, and be able to get service that customer. Um, so that, that has been one of Kroger's biggest opportunities is just labor in the department. So we're figuring out, you know, how do we continue to grow case ready to offset uh, the lack of availability of labor so that we can have our associates doing truly value added work for our customers and not standing back on a saw for seven hours. Mm -hmm. What about mechanization as a response to this? <clears throat> Are there things on the horizon that could um, reduce that demand for labor through uh, uh, technology, AI, et cetera? From a manufacturing standpoint, um, we do a lot of automation, automated slicers, uh, packaging equipment, uh, different things, uh, because even in the case ready environment, uh, it's 34 degrees and it's uh, standing for a lot of hours. So it's not, the, it's not as strenuous as you know, standing in a pork plant breaking hogs, uh, but it's an environment that's not for everybody. So we do look at automation and what opportunities are there uh, to be able to produce product as efficiently as you can. Uh, also looking at things as we get more into net weight, uh, mentioned millennial customers, uh, millennials, uh, millennial customers actually are more about convenience. Uh, we found, you know, rather than buying random weight packages, if you get a net weight package that is a consistent, call it, you know, five bucks, um, they'll pick up that package regardless of what the actual you do the math and realize that they're paying more price per pound. They don't care. It's convenient. They know it's five dollars, and and they're off and running. So that, that's been one of the shocks that we've realized over the last couple of years is kind of the more acceptance around those things, and to be able to do that, uh, we need advanced technologies in the plants to do it. From the south side, and in my niche in particular, and it's probably why I still have a niche is it's been very difficult, and I rely on the the builders and bigger companies to help us. Now we've done a lot of things for the animals from a, I don't know what they call it, artificial intelligence or what you hear that we have better sensors, better controllers, uh, real time uh, information on temperatures and all in there. But, but when we're birthing pigs and breeding sows, there's just really no way not to do that. You know, the chicken will lay the egg by herself. We, we have to help with that birthing process. It's too valuable to not be there and assisting with that. So we've struggled. There's been a little bit of uh, technology. Uh, most of it's all automated feeding today, which has uh, been, well, I frankly, I don't think you can survive in our industry without it because the sow, when milking needs all the feed she can get. Uh, but we've tried some automated washers that would really save some time and perhaps do a better job and they just, they just don't work for our satisfaction. So we. We would love to do that. I hate to say that to, to the laborers of the world, or maybe nobody wants to do it like we said, but we've really struggled to find significant innovation on the pig side. Yeah, exactly the same. Uh, you know, this, it's a biological animal and it takes, it takes somebody there to be there with that sow when she's a birthing or breeder and things like that. We've, we've done some exact same things, looking at automatic washing of rooms and and look at some other equipment and that, and you know, you always uh, got to put those projects through and justify uh, labor savings, but we still have the same number of people on the farm. So uh, there's just, it, it's difficult on the farm when you have animals to do that. There's more opportunity at the processing plants. The cold water facility uh, prided itself in that that plant uh, uh, was built with a lot of more mechanization. And I think that they estimated they saved two or 300 jobs been through the plant. Most of that was on the packaging side too. It wasn't with, in the carcass side of it. So, you know, uh, it's got to be people smarter than me that can figure that stuff out. I know it's out there. It's just, there's not a lot available today. Ben, 
Bailey, do we have time for one question from the audience at least? Okay. Is there a question from the audience? We've got a, quite an assemblage of uh, talent up here. You could ask questions you might have about supply chains, pork sector right now. Any questions out there? Imagine, Alan Lyons had a question. Alan, go ahead. I may have missed it, but have any of you addressed the idea of the whole concept of gene editing in the animal world and how the consumer might take that? So, I'm thinking particularly in terms of animal welfare. CRISPR. Where we're talking about editing genes so that the male, when they're born, don't have testicles that need to be castrated. Does that want to take first? <laughs> the only, the first one I've seen is just the, the PERS. Everybody familiar with that, but I think it's PIC and uh, was it K State, Tim, or was it uh, Missouri? Missouri that, that uh, has found it. I would say it would be almost market ready tomorrow if, if consumers will accept this. And I, I guess I have an opinion on that. I'm, I'm not a GMO. Fear monger, for lack of a better term, I, I, I think they're well researched, but I obviously have an axe to grind here. But I think I think they're coming. I, the question is whether the world, not just the United States, is going to let those in, right? Yeah, same thing. The PERS is the big one on the forefront out there right now. Uh, it's uh, we can we can eliminate PERS if, if the USDA will approve that or the FDA. They're fighting over who has control over that. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities. Yeah, castration, I'm sure they can do that. There, there is sex semen today. It's mostly used at the high nucleus level because it's just not cost effective today. Uh, so yeah, uh, you know, our, our feedback is that the consumer's not ready for it. And, uh, and you know, there's people even within our own business that use that for their opportunity to s survive themselves that, aren't, that can't afford it or go that way, that uh, uh, don't want it either so that they can survive. But uh, there's a lot of opportunity in the human side that's not being recognized today. Yeah, I'd say one of the biggest issues that we have as a retailer looking at those type technologies is the amount of misinformation that travels so quickly via social media. I mean, we deal with on, occa on occasions about once a month or something, we'll get a picture or something that someone will post a product that they bought and they're misinformed about either what they're seeing, what they think, all these different things. And so when you take that, just the misconception that's out there in general uh, with people not understanding where their food comes from, and then you start layering on complexities around gene editing and things like that, um, it creates a lot of angst uh, within our group uh, about those technologies coming forward just because as much as we can try to educate the consumer they listen to what their friend posted. They read what their friend posted on Facebook and, you know, something that, you know, you trace it back and there's no truth to it whatsoever. But um, those things are out there and we battle them on a daily basis. Well, great. Thanks for that question, Alan. And um, let's thank our guests for bringing us up to speed on the pork supply chain. <laughs> <laughs>